I'm William Chamberlain. What you're about to see is a fictionalized account based upon the actual history of Henry O. Flipper. He was the first black man to graduate from West Point. That was in 1877. I didn't meet him until three years later when he was assigned to duty at Fort Davis, Texas. I uh, lived near the fort, made watches, and mended them. Now, there are two things about Fort Davis that are crucial to our story. The first is, all the officers except for Henry are white. The second is, all the enlisted men are black. Flipper was a lieutenant with three years service fighting Indians, acting commissary of subsistence, 10th U.S. Cavalry, a published author, and a gentle man. He had a friend, Molly Riley. She was the sister-in-law of the company commander. They'd go out riding together, and she took an interest in his social life. And this is where the trouble began. Or maybe it began some other place, some other time. And Henry just didn't see it coming. I don't even know what we're doing. I told you. It's very fashionable, and you're good at it. There's no such step. You made it up. I did not. Now stop being such a coward. Oh, you tore it off. That's called assaulting an officer. You could end up in the guardhouse for that. You pulled away. That's conduct on becoming an officer. Mm -hmm. Think they'll put us in the same cell? I think not, Miss Riley. Think of the scandal. I'll tell them I won't go without you. I believe in the equality of the races, don't you, Mr. Flipper? If it means chasing an Irish wild cat around the dance floor, galloping after her on a horse, then I suppose I do. Oh. <laughs> there are some gentlemen I know who would consider it an honor to take me riding. Then I suggest you go with them. Unless, of course, you don't enjoy riding side saddle at the breakneck speed of one mile for every ten hours. <laughs> then you did see us yesterday. Wasn't that Nordstrom's intention? Of course. He's always looking to spit in your eye. I haven't bothered to notice. You never do. Is that how you got through West Point? I got through by applying myself to my studies and by disregarding the low-bred bullies. They cut you all the time, didn't they? Who? The white boys. And you could never mix with them socially. Once a year, I was invited to the class cotillion, and once a year, I'd answer, thank you, sir, but I'm not too keen on dances. Too much work to do. You never went to any of the dances. That's terrible. I'd have gone with you just to make those brats swallow their pride and take notice of me. Is that why you're with me right now? You let me do what I want. <laughs> and you still treat me like a lady. <laughs> Wipe that grin off your face, sir. Stand attention, sir. Step forward, sir. Now tell me, what were you grinning at just now? I never saw a Negro lieutenant before. Are you the first, sir? Yes, I am, and don't you forget it. Another crack like that will have you court-martialed. Is that clear, beast? Yes, sir. Excuse me, Miss Riley. I think it's time you went back. It's not proper for you to be here alone. Oh, stop being so silly. Lieutenant, are you aware of the fact that a father gave me permission to escort Miss Riley? <laughs> I don't care if he did. I say it's disgusting. Mr. Nordstrom, I suggest we settle our grievances at some other time, some other place. Yes, I wish you would. I'm getting sick and tired of all this. I'll see you home safely, Miss Riley. Oh, for mercy's sake, leave me alone. Now, I'm giving you warning for the last time. Don't bother her again. You think you're safe because all the troops here are your kind. But they can't help you. Mr. Nordstrom, your voice has the distinctive sound of a hyena, which renders all your threats ineffectual. The hyena always sulks in the herd, being too cowardly to attack alone. 
If it weren't for Molly, I'd settle this right now. You better hurry. The fellow hyenas might have cost her on the way home. From that grin, it looks like Plea Flipper is real proud of himself. It's been three months, Jim, and I still got my fingers crossed. But I'm doing all right. Even managed to grab myself a few laughs. You let the white boys laugh at you? No, I, I was laughing with them. The captain asked that Todd to explain the theory of twilight. Well, Mr. Todd thought he'd rag out all right by answering, quote, if a spectator should cross this limit of the twilight zone, he would enter final darkness. <laughs> Don't you get it? Final darkness, death. I never learned that stuff because I had to drop that class. I know about your court martial, Jim. It was in the Atlanta papers. Then why haven't you asked me about it? Think they did me fair? It happened before I got here, Jim. I can't judge. I was ordered to fetch water. When I got to the faucet, Wilson said, I'd like to see any damn nigger get water before me. Then he kicked my pill over. When I went to write it, he hit me with his dipper. By the time we were pulled apart, we both needed stitches. The court martial white boys said I was the one who started it, so of course I was suspended for the rest of the year. I'm sorry, Jim. Now, you want to tell me that joke again? About crossing over into the twilight. Colonel Shafter, this is Lieutenant Charles Nordstrom. Rest. Colonel Shafter, sir. Welcome to Fort Davis. Speaking for the white officers, I can say we're glad to have a man of your reputation in command. What we reputation? Need... I hate the stinking greasers and will go 400 miles out of my way to knock the crap out of them. What do you mean my reputation is a whipcracker to the darky soldiers? We've heard about your success with the Mexican outlaws, sir. And with the Indians. They stay on the reservation when Colonel Shafter's around. They call him the Pecos Devil. That's why Wilhelm is my adjutant. He reminds all you officers what a damn hero I am. Lieutenant Wilhelm, Sergeant Ross tells me you were at West Point a few years back. Well, I was, uh, uh, until I got sick and had to leave. Bat crap. He couldn't hack to work. He'd never keep his rank now if I didn't cover his tracks for him. He's a pervert. He loves those greaser whores, don't you, Carl? Yes, sir. <laughs> there is an officer here, sir, who did graduate from West Point. Lieutenant Flipper. I know about your famous black lieutenant. That's all my staff talked about when I was at Fort Cabot. You gave us a good laugh. <clears throat> yes, sir. But the problem's yours now, sir. He's not going to be any problem for me. Well, help me. You think you can go next door and find Lieutenant Flipper without getting lost along the way? Yes, sir. Then do it. What are Lieutenant Flipper's duties? Well, he buys food supplies for the garrison and the outposts. They pay him with cash and checks. And he sends it to headquarters each week. Does he do a good job? Uh, he's real sloppy, sir. He makes his impersonal funds with the subsistence money. Well, you'll see for yourself. He can't send in his weekly statements without your signature. That's the way it should be. Every man on this post is directly responsible to me and to me only. Lieutenant Flipper to see you, sir. Dismissed. Damned leg. They don't know what to give you for varicose veins, so they tell you to stay off your legs like I was some retired general who had nothing to do but sit around chewing the cut all day. Will help me. Never know that man had been to West Point, would you? Yes, sir, I remember seeing him there. Pretty dumb, wasn't he? Oh, I couldn't say so. He wasn't in my classes long enough. No, he got busted before he got into his second year. That means he's damn stupid. Oh, I don't know, sir. Lots of good men had to leave for one reason or another. You made it. First of your kind who did. Yes, sir. 
I had lots of help. The Negro senators pushed for you, did they? No, sir. I mean, I was able to learn from the mistakes of the others, the Negro cadets who had been there before me. No one ever helped me get to West Point. I had to work my way up through the ranks during the war. The war gave you people your freedom. Yes, sir. That is why the Negro soldier was so anxious to be allowed to fight. He had a debt to pay. Don't tell me about the Negro soldier. I was in command of him before you ever left the cotton fields. Yes, sir. Am I to continue in my position as acting commissary of subsistence, sir? I'm going to do some reorganizing around here. But meanwhile, you stay on. Where do you keep the funds? I used to keep them here in the safe, sir, but after Major McLaughlin left, Sergeant Ross told me to find some other place. Have you got some complaint against Sergeant Ross? No, sir. But I've been keeping the funds in my quarter, sir, and if that means you their approval, sir. Every other word you say is, sir, they drill that into you at West Point. Yes, sir. Staff is giving a party for me next week. I don't see any reason why you shouldn't be invited, do you? No, sir. But I'm not too keen on parties. Too much work to do. You take your fun in private, do you? You can go now, Flipper. Sir. Decide not to go home for the Thanksgiving recess, sir? Yes, sir. My home's too far away, and I want to catch up on my studies. I'm Private Bentz, the villain who blasts you out of bed every morning. I'm Plebe, Henry Flipper. I'm pleased to meet you, sir. I guess I'm not the only cadet wandering around here this weekend. Oh, no, there are some others. Getting into mischief, no doubt. Cadet Smith, my friend, is still here, but he's been confined to his quarters. Most of the others have been giving you the silent treatment, haven't they? Aside from official duty, you're the first white man who has spoken to me in months. Sorry to hear that. Don't misunderstand me, Mr. Bentz. I'm not complaining. Well, the first year is always the hardest. After that, you begin to know the ropes. It's not so bad. I'm honored to be here. Very honored. Yes, sir. of the charges, because they were the ones who started it. They pushed their way into my room. Jim, I'm sorry. But thank the Lord you're all right. <laughs> yeah, well, I got no reason to thank you ever. We've got to be immune to their insults. I'm supposed to stand there and let them call me nigger? They're beneath our contempt, Jim. Why should we bother with trash like that? Because it hurts. But you wouldn't know, would you? You're such a good boy. Nobody ever curses you. I've been called all the names you've been called. Nigger, coon, rasta, sambo, the thing, the moke, cuffy, pumpy. And none of those make you want to smash them in the mouth. If I ever let on how much they hurt me, I'd be handing them a weapon. I'd be sharpening it for them. Which one hurt you the most? It doesn't matter. I know all about your principles, Henry, but not what's in your guts. The moke. Cuts the deepest. It means an ass. Well, that's better than being called a mule. <laughs> I've been called that as well. My mother was half white. Is that what you say when you turn the other cheek? Now, look at here, Mr. White Man. I got your blood in this cheek, so you want to be real good to it. I've had less trouble than you because I'm not fooled by the race issue. The problem isn't color, but lack of education. That's real fancy talk. But I want to know how much more you're going to take before you fight back.
may I have your attention, please? This evening's entertainment is about to begin. Uh, so if the ladies will take their seat, the uh, show will get underway. Oh, Colonel Shafter, since you're the guest of honor, you get to watch with the ladies. I don't want to watch any show. I want to watch the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> I am pleased to announce the arrival of our guest speaker. He comes to us directly from the infamous American Miscegenation Society. <laughs> the Reverend Frederick Douglass, Gypsy! <laughs> <laughs> Lady and gentlemen, darkies. <laughs> we have come together this evening to congratulate ourselves upon the success of our great cause, miscegenation, <laughs> otherwise known as the mixing of the races for our benefit. <laughs> Ever since we won the war, single-handedly for a cowardly white man. <laughs> Why, the white man, he's grown more and more fond of us. So our time's coming fast. Soon, dark complexions, they're gonna be all the rage. And the ladies, instead of plying white chalk their faces, will use charcoal. <laughs> and instead of little feet being good, big feet's gonna be. <laughs> Listen, this is a surprise. We didn't think. I mean, no one said you were coming. I invited him myself, but he said he wasn't interested. Change your mind, Flipper. I just dropped by to pay my respects, sir. Miss Flipper always has such good manners. It's a principle with me, Miss Riley. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, Flipper. I appreciate it a whole lot. We were just having a little entertainment. Lieutenant Nordstrom saw a minstrel show in San Antone, and he was uh, acting out a little piece for us. I'm sorry if I interrupted. Why don't you sit down and watch? So as I can finish. Henry, don't stay. No one expects you to stay. I'd like to have dinner soon. So let's get on with it. Well, uh, my darky friends, uh, as I was saying, soon it's going to be fashionable for colored gentlemen <laughs> to have white drivers. Upon the same ground, <laughs> it has heretofore been fashionable for white mans to have Negro drivers. <laughs> T'other man's gonna be the gentleman. And my friends, we all is gentlemen now. That's all. That's all. That's all. <laughs> you were right, Charlie. The Colonel laughed more than anybody. <laughs> you don't uh, suppose Mr. Flipper Toes was upset from a little speech, do you? You make a better nigger than he is. <laughs> but we sure put him in his place, didn't we? That's just for starters, Carl. You know, I think it's time you and I went on a little patrol. When? Oh, one of these nights. All right, sir. What do we do? You stand guard while I reconnoitre? Huh? Well, I don't want Mr. Flipper Toes to know I've been visiting these quarters, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I ain't associating with them with lays on the ground and plays dead when there's a free fight going on, says he. <laughs> <laughs> then Brad Possum grin and laugh fit to kill himself. <laughs> Good evening, William. Lucy. Mr. Henry. 
Lucy, have you finished cleaning? All done, Mr. Henry. I was on my way home, but William says I have to hear about Brer Possum. You shouldn't <laughs> stay on after you finish. It's a bad habit. Henry, Henry, you gotta hear some of these tales. They'll make you laugh till, you, till your sides split. <laughs> They've been in the papers for years, and they've been funny to me. Like your watermelon jokes, your coon hunting stories, Rasta stories, Sambo stories, and your minstrel shows. We was just having fun. What's wrong with that? Lucy, where's my notebook with the clippings in it? I don't know. Well, it was in there the last time I saw. You know, Lucy, you're supposed to keep this trunk neat. I try, but you always rooting around in there. You see what he does? And how can a person keep it neat? What's in the cigar box? Well, that's where I keep all the money. I told him he best find someplace else. Sergeant Ross thinks I might contaminate his safe. Anyhow, how did you know what was in there? I hear that money jingle. Every time I put back your clean laundry. Ah, here it is. Now, if we can only find that piece about Absalom Boston, he was Negro. He worked his way up to being captain of a whaling ship, then he started writing poetry. About Negro whales? No, about the Arctic. Just listen, will you? <laughs> Wondrous it is to see the great caribou flocking from the forests, spreading over the snow in flight. Glorious it is to see the sun come up over the heavens and make white the sky of night. Isn't that marvelous? Now, this is the kind of Negri you should be reading about a steady or ignorant vulgar Uncle Remus. <clears throat> Watch out, Lucy. He's a real fire eater tonight. Uh, what's the matter, Henry? Did they turn you down on your ditch again? What ditch? Why, Lucy, you see before you the greatest engineer since Moses took on the Red Sea. Why, Henry's a genius when it comes to getting water to skedaddle. When I was stationed at Fort Concha, Lucy, I engineered a series of canals to drain the water off. I want to do the same thing here in order to reduce the threat of fever epidemics. Yeah, but they're going to they're gonna keep on turning them down because they're scared it might work. You know why they keep him in the commissary? Because he's rotten at it. Henry can't even give you the right change for a quarter. Will you shut up? Oh, I know William's right. I know they don't appreciate you, Mr. Henry. All the soldiers tell me so. I wish you'd spend more time doing your job and less worrying about me. You know what one of the private said to me yesterday? How is your woman, Lucy? Now, why do you think he said that? I don't know. Whatever the reason, it's got to stop. Did you hear me, Lucy? Why don't you just bite the girl's head off and be done with it? I'm sorry, I must be tired. Yeah. I gotta be going. I'll be back tomorrow for the laundry. That's fine, Lucy. When you're mad at me, you just come on out and say, I don't mind. Good night, Lucy. Good night, sir. Now, William. Lucy. That girl's gonna spend the rest of the week trying to get on your good side, if you got one. She doesn't understand. None of the troops do either. It's like there's a language barrier between us. Well, Henry, you may write for those brainy magazines at North, but you sure don't talk like no Negro. The people who read the American magazine are educated. Anyway, my contract is finished. They know more than enough about the colored cadet at West Point. Well, why don't you write something new? Tell them about the colored lieutenant at Fort Davis. What do I write? That my fellow officers are bullies and hyenas? That my superior relieved me as acting commissary because he doesn't trust me? He would if you were white. Oh, William, a commanding officer is duty bound to be above prejudice. Shafter may not do too much to stop the others, but he'll not take part in their insults. Henry, they are out to bust you any way they can. Every private on this fort knows it. Don't you ever listen? You think threats are new to me? They were whispered and mumbled during my four years at West Point. If I stoop to listen, I never straighten out in time to get my diploma. Well, remember what Uncle Remus said. If in your coattail catch on fire, don't wait till you see the blaze before you put it out. Uncle Remus belongs on a slave plantation, along with every other Negro who is ignorant enough to listen to him. Haven't you got anything better to read? Well, yeah. You gave me a book once. I uh, didn't read too much, but I remember I... Spilled a lot of coffee on it, though. 
Why do I even bother with you? Is it because I fixed your watch for free? That must be it. <laughs> now, will you get out of here and let me get some sleep? Well, as Bro Possum said to Bro Coon, I was gone before I come. <laughs> <laughs> You, you gonna give another one of those darky shows and get him to play in it? I don't think we'll have to. He's gonna do it for us. In fact, he already has. Yeah, how's that? Well, just like I thought, sir. You've been mighty careless with those commissary funds. You wouldn't go so far as to steal from the man, would you? Over a thousand dollars. He didn't tell me it was that much. Where do you get that kind of money? Cash paid to the commissary, you idiot. But I thought he was supposed to send it in the headquarters. That's the usual procedure, but lately he's been saving it up. Yes, sir, but you have been auditing his books each week. Haven't you, sir? I told you I wouldn't bother him, and I haven't. Let the man hang himself. Yes, sir. Everybody knows he's lax as hell. He never goes over his accounts unless I'm on his tail every minute. Yes, you've been very patient with him, sir. It takes time to reorganize. <laughs> yes, sir. By the way, what do you plan to do with the missing funds? See, everybody gets his fair share, sir. So we can have a going-away party for Sambo. Send him off the guardhouse in style. <laughs> Whatever happens, I'm not in your party, right? Yes, sir, I understand. Don't give anything to Will Helmy. He'll only throw it away on his greaser whores, won't you? Yes, sir. Stupid jackass. Go tell Flipper to get his books ready. I want a full account in Monday morning. Do I look like an ignorant man? Do my ears look like a pair of bookends for an empty tunnel? Then explain to me what it is you like about the Army. Because from the first day you went to West Point, wouldn't nobody even talk to you. That's not true. Bench the bugler was my friend. Yeah. 400 cadets running around. The only person you could talk to was the bugler. You don't understand. You're a civilian. Sometimes when we're out in field maneuvers, I forget the jeers and the insults. For a few moments, I even forget to breathe. We didn't have to breathe anymore because we weren't separate cadets with separate lungs and separate hearts. We became one gigantic caisson. A machine whose driving force was the spirit of unity. Mm. We were convinced that no sword, or bullet, or cannon could ever penetrate the oneness that we shared. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a nice dream, Henry, but this ain't West Point. Best you started locking your door at night. Officers and gentlemen have no reason to bolt their doors. But if there wasn't nothing but chickens around, wouldn't be no need to latch the coop, neither. This is an army post, not a den of thieves. Then what about that Trump? Hmm? What about that Trump? If you're so damn trusting, why don't you leave it open like you do your front door? As long as I'm a lieutenant in the United States Army, it is my duty to treat every officer as a gentleman. My door stays open. Mr. Flipper, now the colonel asked me to remind you that you're to be at his office first thing in the morning. He wants the commissary funds ready for verification and transmittal. Thank you, Mr. Wilhelm. Yeah, I'll be there. And, uh... I'm supposed to tell you that one of your people wants to see you. Private Tilly's in the guardhouse, been asking for you. Colonel Shafter says you can see him if you want. Is everything all right, Henry? Have you got yourself in some kind of trouble? No. There's some paperwork to go over. short for January. Henry, I've got good news. Now you're going to have someone to talk to besides me, one of your own kind. A few weeks ago it came out right. Why should it be wrong now? Mr. Whitaker, you are a lucky fellow because right there is the finest cadet at the point. He'll be happy to set you straight on things, get you off to a good start. Won't you, Henry? I should have tallied every week, but still, it, 
It couldn't be that much. Henry, this is Johnson Whitaker, the new cadet. I've got to cover myself. I could write a personal check. You couldn't find a better man to help you. But I haven't got that kind of money in my account. If you stick with Mr. Flipper, you can't go wrong. If only they'd pay me for the articles I wrote. I need help. I'll do whatever you say, Mr. Flipper. I'm real pleased to be meeting you. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Willoughby. And I'll do my best to guide you. But you must understand, here at West Point, we're thrown back on our own resources. For the Negro, far more than for any white man, this is a testing time. Every quality, every positive attribute you thought you possessed will be put on trial. You'll even have to defend your right to exist. Drop that defense for even a second and your accusers will be on you like vultures. When that happens, no man, black, or white will come to your rescue. Well, like the bugle man says, I can't mess up with you helping me because you've been through it already. You know the ropes. That's right, Mr. Whitaker. We're both safe because I know the ropes. Probably halfway to Mexico by now, jumping like a scared jackrabbit. Why are you so late, Flipper? I said first thing in the morning. Yes, sir, but I passed by the guardhouse to see Private Tilly. I was told you wanted me to visit him, sir. I said nothing of the kind. I said he had permission to see you if you felt like seeing him, but that could have waited. You got everything ready for transfer? Yes, sir. Well, you want me to sign a statement, or don't you? You know, you relax as hell lately, Flipper. Don't you remember regulations? Each week, without fail, you are supposed to submit your accounts for my verification. Did that slip your mind? No, sir. But you told me that as long as Major Small was absent from headquarters, I needn't bother Don't coming... Don't contradict me. I know what I said. After you send these into headquarters, I want to see your accounts every week. You understand? Yes, sir. January and February, eh? Yes, sir. One for January feels awfully thin. Must be checks, mostly. You got them all present and accounted for? Yes, sir. The statements and checks tally. This is a hell of a large personal check, Mr. Flipper. You see that will help me? Check for a thousand dollars. You must have a pretty fat bank account. You got money coming in from someplace other than your army pay? Yes, sir. I'm the editor of the American magazine for a series of articles I wrote. Here I will, homie. Man writes articles. You better keep your big blabber mouth shut. He could publish to everybody what a damn fool you are. You ever write any articles about me? No, sir. I was commissioned to write about my experience at West Point. Flipper. We're not gold braided enough for you. You love to prance around on parade wearing those white gloves of yours. Or maybe you'd rather be building a couple of fancy bridges and canals like you did at Fort Concho. You don't want to be down here doing the dirty work with the likes of us. I have no complaints, sir. Why do all the darky soldiers come crying to you? Like that private in the guardhouse? He was frightened and confused. He thought maybe I could help him. What'd he tell you? He couldn't tell me. Private Tilly says he has a bad back, sir. He thinks he wants to go into the hospital. I say he's faking it. Now, who you gonna believe? Him or me? Henry? You shouldn't have left me alone. I told you you shouldn't. They waited till you were gone, and then they did it. What happened to you? How'd you They get came into my room and tied me up. Flashed me with the mirror glass and beat me in the face. Oh, who did it to you? The white cadets, three of them. They sent me a warning letter, but I was too scared to report it.
cut my face and I finally passed out. Your own classmate? I have the letter they sent. I can prove it. Impossible. Henry, there's going to be a court martial. Now everybody's going to know what they did to me. Tell me the truth. What really happened? Henry, will you testify for me? You can be a character witness. No, I can't. But everybody respects you. I'm just about to graduate. But they'll listen to you. I can't afford to get involved now. Henry, you got to stand up for me. There's no one else on my side. My testimony won't help you. Then why not? Because I don't believe you. I'd like to send a telegram to New York City, please. Yes, sir. To William Parker, editor of the American Magazine. 9 March. 1881. Anxiously awaiting payment for the articles I wrote. Please wire funds immediately. Henry O. Flipper, Fort Davis, Texas. It says $3,500 in transit. You sent them off to headquarters last week? Yes, sir. Mailed them yourself? Yes, sir. Let me know when San Antonio acknowledges receipt. I'd like to know what's going on, Mr. Flipper. Yes, sir. I'd like to send Lieutenant a telegram. Lieutenant Flipper, this just came in over the wire. It's for you. Thank you. 16 March. To acting commissary of subsistence, Lieutenant Henry O. Flipper. Commissary funds and statements for the months of January and February have not been received. Please transfer immediately. Major M.P. Small, Chief Commissary of Subsistence, Department of Texas, San Antonio, Texas. It can't be much longer. Sir? Before they acknowledge receipt. It's been in transit for a month now. Just three weeks, sir. The stage was probably delayed. Yeah. Well, let me know the moment you hear. 23 March. Urgent. Please honor contract. Send payment directly to San Antonio Bank in my name. I'm in desperate need. Flipper, Fort Davis, Texas. See, why is that trunk wide open? Didn't I tell you? I was just getting fixed up for the dance. Remember, I asked you, could I get my new dress out? Nobody been at the trunk for me. I said you could use the trunk for your jewelry, one or two dresses. Look how you filled it up. This is my best dress. It's very nice. William came by a while ago. You know what he said? He said. Just wait till Henry sees you in that nigger dress. Well, if that's what you're thinking, why don't you just come right out and say it? The truth is, I don't like that dress. It's gaudy and cheap, like the perfume you're wearing, those trashy earrings. Why do you think the men in town make remarks when they see you? Well, I don't pay no attention to what they say. They trash. Well, I do. Lucy, you have to pay attention because the privates and black people everywhere look to us as an example. We can't afford to make any mistakes. You want me to be uppity and high tone, like that Molly Riley. Everybody knows what you wanted with her. But she turned you down, run off with one of her own kind. That remark is beneath my contempt. Oh, stop talking so fancy. You want to chase after white women, make a fool of yourself, go on. But don't you dare say it's my dress you don't like, or my earrings, or my flower water. What you don't like is my skin, and I could scrub it and scrub it, and it'd still be too black for you. Wait, where are you going? To get drunk. Fool with the ladies. To get my troubles like every other nigger on Saturday night. Henry, come with me to the dance. You could be my partner. It would make me very happy. A 
If I want a partner in a red dress, I'll go after one of the senoritas at the hotel. They don't make any pretense about what they are. kicked me out, Henry. The verdict was based upon solid evidence. Why can't you look at me, Henry? The doctors who examined you that day are convinced that your wounds were self-inflicted. They're lying. I was tied and beaten by the cadets. They sent a warning ahead of time. Five different handwriting analysts testify that you wrote that warning note. That's a dirty lie. They're all white men, just like the doctors. But the most damning evidence was the fact... I know why you wouldn't help me. That that warning note was You're not from. black. One of your own notebooks. You're a white man. You're a traitor. You're a white man. To our comrades who have fallen, one cup before you go. They pour their life blood free. Mr. Henry. Lucy, what are you doing here? I must have fallen asleep. Mm. Mm. Mr. Henry, are you all right? I'm fine. You look kind of funny. <laughs> That's understandable. I've been having fun. <laughs> it's perfectly natural for a man who's been having fun to look funny. <laughs> Did you have fun at your dance? No. I left early. I'm extremely sorry to hear that, Miss Lucy. Henry, I think you're drunk. <laughs> you mistake yourself, Miss Lucy. Officers and gentlemen of the United States Army are never drunk. From time to time, however, we do indulge in the respected tradition known as inebriety. <laughs> you know what? I think you're more high-toned drunk than you are sober. <laughs> oh, Lucy, how right you are. Why should eyebrows be raised? It's perfectly natural for a white girl to go riding with a black man so long as he's a high-toned officer and gentleman like Henry O. Flipper. She hurt you, didn't she, Henry? No. I never thought Molly Riley was good enough for me. I thought myself not only equal, but superior to those white boys at West Point. So when I got down here, I found myself surrounded by obsequious hyenas, ignorant brutes, I said to myself, Molly Riley may be a bit crude, hardly well-educated, but she is white. That's the least I deserve for all my hard work. Oh, you mustn't feel bad, Henry. There are lots of black men run after white women. Mm -hmm. But they aren't hypocrites. They admit what they're doing. I got through West Point by bending low every time they cracked the whip. Whitaker knew it, that's why he asked me to testify for him. He cut his own face, bloodied his own nose, but at least he did it to himself. I let the white boys do it to me for four years. I never even noticed. Well, everybody looks up to you. Henry, the folks in town, the soldiers, even the white men. The officers here barely tolerate me. The enlisted men would hate me if they knew what I was. Nobody could hate you. Well, my tactics book. There's a section in there, order. Review how to survive when lost in occupied enemy territory. That was written especially for me. I know it. I've been wandering in occupied territory ever since I was born. Now, what were those instructions? Do you want me to look for your book? That's it. I'm supposed to find those who are sympathetic to my cause, make sure they can be trusted, and then befriend them. Do you forgive me, Lucy? I haven't trusted you nearly enough. There's nothing to forgive. But I lied to you. I told you I didn't like you in that red dress. The truth is you're, you're beautiful no matter what you wear.
You should have come with me to the dance. <laughs> Don't you remember? I'm too proud to go to nigger dances. You mustn't talk that way, Henry. It's not decent. Is it decent that I've wanted you ever since you came here? That I want you now more than ever? You don't feel ashamed of me. The only shame I feel is for the way I've treated you. Flipper, you know what's happened, don't you? I just left the colonel's office for the tenth time today. You've been relieved of your commissary duties. You're to turn over all present funds, along with any statements, books, receipts. I know why you're here, Mr. Ross. You can start with the cash in hand. That's a funny place to keep the money. I'd prefer to use the safe, if you recall. This is the one for March? Yes, and the statements and checks tally. Well, that's fine, Mr. Flipper, just fine. Too bad you're still in the soup for January and February. Still say the stage was robbed? I said it was a possibility. Well, the colonel thinks so, too. So he'd like you to make out a list of all the checks you sent in. That way we can stop payment if they were stolen. He wants that list first thing in the morning. He's boiling mad. I saw that for myself. That money doesn't turn up soon. Somebody's going to get himself hung. If I were in your boots tonight, I'd be looking for a fast horse and a slow sunrise. Henry. What are you doing here? I just thought I'd wait for you to get back. I asked you not to do that. After work, you to go straight home. What did he want? White men never come round unless there's trouble. There's nothing wrong. Now go home. Please. It's those envelopes they want, isn't it? Listen. You don't know anything about these, you hear? You haven't seen them for weeks, no matter what anyone says. If you tell me what's the matter, maybe I can help. There's nothing wrong. So long as this trunk stays locked, never, ever turn your back when it's open. I just need a little more time. Oh, Henry, that looks awful. Did you see anyone prowling around here while I was out just now? No. They're still trying to get in. I know it. If I could catch them, if I had proof, I could go to Shafter. If you were trying to hide these, you sure did a poor job. The list he wants will give me more time, but I can't mention my check. He could wire the back. Now, that looks a lot nicer. I'll wait a couple of days, and I'll send everything off. I'll have to. Henry. Thank you, Lucy. I appreciate your help. You know that. But you don't let me help enough. Is it the money you need? I got some. I've been don't, saving. Don't, Lucy, don't make it worse. I've asked too much of you already. Can I stay with you tonight, Henry? It's getting late. For just a little while longer. I've got my commissary books to go over. Don't you like me even a little bit? Please, Lucy. I don't want to hurt you anymore. It's not touching you that hurts the most. Good night, Lucy. I'll be back first thing in the morning to do the cleaning. That'll be fine. What do you want? 
I just came to, to change my dress. I gotta go into town before I go to work. We found your things in his trunk. I got no safe place to keep them where I live. I gotta go into town. I can't wear this old rag. Well, get your dress and get out of here. Shall we commence to commit by all means? Mr. Whitaker, I understand that you was booted out of West Point after just two years. That's so, that's so, Mr. Smith. But I understand that you, quite to the contrary, lasted almost five years before they busted you. Yes, so I did, Mr. Whitaker, so I did. Well, tell me, how did you manage to last so long? Well, it was this way, Mr. Whitaker. My first year, I was what you might call a very mean ducky. Whenever I was insulted, I'd flash you a shot of white teeth and raise my fist in a downright killing humor. However, every time I did this, I was rudely visited by a jaw full of white knuckles, which knocked me flat off my presumption. After numerous setbacks, I decided to become a good mule and to bite down on the bit. Well, shut my mouth. That's exactly what I did. And it looked like I was going to make it. But lo, in a hole, they done snatched the rug from under me. They flunked me out on optics. Pray tell, what is these here optics? That means that the eyes have it while the nays don't. And we, my friend, are the nays. <laughs> yup, yup, yup. Well, yep. I'll be kidding. No, I was right out of the part without so much as a second chance. Oh, that's too bad. That's too bad. But they were much nicer to me. They give me three whole chances to pass. Three whole chances? How is that? Well, first, I had a chance to pass out cold after the attack. That's chance number one. And then I had a chance to report the ruckus after I woke up. That's chance number two. I told them about the fight, mm -hmm. and they rushed right out and found a culprit. They says to me, as usual, it was a darky for them to blame. No, so what did you do then? Well, being the only darky around, I hit myself, naturally. And that knocked you out? Sure did. A West Point. Yuck, 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 yuck. Too buy it. Too buy it. But I understand that one doctor made it all the way through. Who be that? Oh, that be Flipper, the monk. How did the monk do it? By keeping himself like the three Chinese monkeys. The three Chinese monkeys? It was like this. Whenever you and me got ourselves into trouble. He turned a deaf ear. Yeah, no evil. Show sure enough. Whenever somebody would slap him in the face, he'd shut his eyes. He'd turn the upper cheek. See no evil. Show sure enough. And when they asked his opinion of the white man's army, he done bit his tongue clear off. Show sure enough again. <laughs> but now, the moke is real sorry. Why is that? You ever try to call for help without a tongue? Ow! 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 You can stop your search. I found the envelopes that were supposed to be in transit. Where'd you find them, sir? On his serving girl. She tried to sneak off with them, but I caught her red-handed. Mr. Ross, take a look at these. I figured you were a thief, but I had no proof, so I had to play cat and mouse with you. You might have snuck past me, too, if Lucy hadn't confessed everything. What did she say? 
But you gave her those to hide. I'm holding you responsible for the theft of government money. But it's all here, in the envelopes. Is it? Mr. Ross, how much do you find in there? Well, there's uh, $2,000 in checks, but uh, the last statement says there should be a grand total of $3,500. Including the cash? Well, there isn't any cash here. Only checks. But it has to be here. I put it there myself. You lied about sending them off because you stole the cash. I'm putting you under arrest for the theft of $1,500. Take him to the guardhouse. Put him in solitary. And make sure no one comes near him. Glad to see you. Henry, are you all right? I am now. Good, listen, I brought Mr. Mr. Cinder along. He's collecting money from the townspeople. And he's loaning us $500 out of his own pocket. You've got lots of friends in town, Mr. Flipper. We raised $1,700 already. We expect more tomorrow. I'm deeply grateful, sir. Shaft is in a big hurry. Says he's got to have that money by tomorrow noon, and he means it. Your colonel can't decide what he wants more, the money made up or your hide. He's a filthy, rotten, big head. Now, William. You mustn't talk like that. Just because he hates all Negroes and Jews and Mexicans and Indians and Italians and Chinese, that's no reason to criticize the man. Well, he's no different from every other officer I know, except for Mr. Flipper here. But he's trying to be fair. He's given us a chance to make up the money. Fair? Henry, you've been robbed two times. And you call that fair? Now, William, we have no proof. No proof. First, they steal $1,000 out of his trunk. Then, when he thinks he's got it covered with that check, they turn around and steal another $1,500 out of them envelopes. Lucy took the envelopes. She thought it might help. Yes, and when Shafter got them, the money was still inside, too. I mean, she could hear the money jingling. She could feel how heavy they were. She's in jail now. She's charged with robbery, but we're going to get her out just as soon as we can. Well, at least she's not in solitary. Shafter gave an order. He didn't want to see anybody black near you. The last time I tried to see you, they threw me off the post. He gave us five minutes now because we swore we'd discuss only the money. Well, go on, go on. Tell him about Charles chat this morning. I let the colonel do most of the talking. I, I didn't try to defend you. As far as he knew, my only business was to arrange a loan. Purely business. That's when he said he was piling it on you to teach you a lesson. There's going to be a court martial, Henry. They're setting it up as fast as they can. We sent to West Point for a lawyer. They gotta send somebody. Maybe. Time's up. The question is, how do we stop the clock until he gets here? Time's up! Goodbye, Mr. Flipper. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My friends. Here, sir. Over here. There's time for just one more answer. The Twilight Zone is produced primarily by the reflection of sunlight from the upper atmosphere. That's the scientific definition. But for a better answer, ask a mulatto. You all know what a mulatto is. He's a man whose skin tone is darker than daytime, but lighter than nighttime. Because his skin is this in-between shade, he finds no welcome from the inhabitants of either day or night. He's condemned to solitary wandering in the twilight zone. How long did Absalom Boston wander before he could pilot a ship through enemy-occupied waters and finally reach the Arctic Circle? We don't know. But we do know what he found when he got there. Glorious it is to see the sun come up over the heavens and make white the sky of night. Do you realize what that would mean to a man lately come from the twilight? To blend into the one color that is all colors, to breathe in unison with everything that exists.
loud applause greeted the close of the general's speech, and the graduates were called up one by one and their diplomas delivered to them. When Mr. Flipper, the colored cadet, stepped forward to receive his reward for four years of hard work, the cadets gave him a rousing cheer. He deserved it. Lieutenant Flipper's lawyer, I tell you, I need more time. You've had one postponement already. It was given to Flipper while I was still at West Point. We're in the second week of this trial, and I haven't even gotten through all the commissary records yet. Well, why come to me if you have any objections? Because I want to know what's going on around here. You afraid your case is too weak? Is that why everyone is so anxious to get this trial over with? Captain Barber, I did not select the date of this trial. General Auger, the commander of the Department of Texas, set the schedule. And I want to know why. Is Lieutenant Flipper some kind of mortal threat to Colonel Shafter's command down here? General Auger has publicly expressed great confidence in Colonel Shafter. His record against the Mescaleros is superlative. No other commander has been able to control the frontier troops as well as he. And by frontier troops, you mean Negro troops? The frontier army is to a large extent made up of Negroes. Therefore, the discipline of the Negro soldier is crucial to the success of our endeavors here. And General Auger is concerned that this trial might upset discipline. In the light of all the publicity that surrounds this case, may I suggest that you concentrate all your efforts on establishing the innocence of your client? Justice will be well served in that way. And if I can't do that without calling attention to Colonel Shafter's possible dailies? There are aspects of this case which are highly undignified. For example, the relationship between Flipper and his servant girl. Now, I wouldn't want to see that kind of scandal sully my prosecution of the case. Any more than you would wish to be disrespectful towards Colonel Shafter in making your defense. I make no bargains. I offered none. Thank you, Captain Klaus. Colonel Shafter, after the checks were found on Lucy Smith, what did you do? Took them from her and said, where did you get these, Lucy? And she said, Lieutenant Flipper gave them to her and told her to hide them. <laughs> and then what did you do? Took the two envelopes, told her I'd make out a charge against her that would probably send her to the penitentiary. And what did you find in the envelopes? Just the checks including Flipper's personal check, which turned out to be no good. The cash was stolen. And did you make out that charge against Lucy Smith? That afternoon, I made an affidavit against her for the theft of government property. Yet just now you said that Lucy told you that the envelopes were given to her by Lieutenant Flipper. Which is it? Best evidence is the affidavit itself. Let it be read now. No. That affidavit is inadmissible evidence. It is self-incriminating for Lucy Smith. If counsel for the defense wishes to refer to the affidavit, let him call for its presentation at this time. But it is contrary to civil law. It was made under duress. For over three weeks, the court has been patient with the counsel for the defense. But our patience is growing thin. Less diversions, please. The court will recess for an hour. Hemmed in from every side. I feel like a reserve general thrown in to rescue a hopeless cause. How can I defend a position when I don't know who I'm fighting, where they are, how many weapons they have? I'll answer anything you ask, sir. Well, that's not good enough. And stop this sir business. I need more than your polite cooperation. You have got to open every door for me. Peel back your very skin so that I can get in there with you. That is, if your pride will let me. You think I'm proud? After all I told you? You are wallowing in your guilt. And that's nothing but pride turned inside out. You wear it like a hair shirt. This morning on my way to court, a Negro private stopped me and said, 
Captain, you've got to save Lieutenant Flipper. He shouldn't have to take the rap for us. I asked him what he meant. He said that Colonel Shafter was getting back at you for all the times you stuck your neck out for men like him. He said you risked a demotion to get him out of solitary. Now, that man thinks you're holding back to protect him when, in fact, you haven't given him a thought. If you had, you'd realize that the only way to help him and black people everywhere is to win this case by speaking up. You can start right now. As the judge advocate, concrete proof of your affair with Lucy. What will come out if I go after Colonel Shafter? That's why I've told you everything there is to know. All right. They took things from your room, like that scrapbook. Yes. Are there love letters in there? When are you going to get back your belongings so that I can see everything the prosecution has seen? I will not beg Shafter for anything. Then stop begging me to protect Lucy. She's willing to trust me, because unlike you, she's got no false pride. I'm coming back in this courtroom tomorrow. And I'm going to open fire on Shafter. And if he doesn't shoot back, the judge advocate will. Then you'll have a choice. You can fall on your knees and cry over the wounded. Or you can stand up and help us fight back. Colonel Shafter, we were talking about the interview in your office with Lucy Smith. Did you not say to her that if she would tell you all she knew about Lieutenant Flipper, she could have a house in the garrison and friends among the officers, and that you yourself would drop around to see her once in a while? I object. Did you not say to her, damn you, you will go to the penitentiary, and Flipper, damn him, I finally got him where I want I object. I did not. That's a lie, like everything else you got from Lucy Flipper. Captain Barber, I am warning you. After the checks were discovered on Lucy Smith, you then returned to Lieutenant Flipper's quarters and told the officers to stop the search. You then had Lieutenant Flipper placed in solitary confinement. Do you remember any civilian asking permission to speak with him while he was there? No, I do not. I have a note from Mr. Sender, a local merchant, asking that you permit the bearer to speak with your prisoner. This note was brought to you by Mr. William Chamberlain. Yeah, now I remember. Uh, he came to me drunk, asked to see Flipper. I told him to clear out. I recollect it now. Then you admit the fallibility of your memory in regard to some of the circumstances surrounding this event. The man was a drunken nigger, some boyfriend of Lucy's, probably. That's no response to my question. I'm getting sick and tired of this. Four weeks is enough. That is no response to my question in any manner, shape, or form. That's just too damn bad. I insist upon an answer. The counsel for the defense will stop badgering the witness and get on with his next question. I have no more questions for this witness. And the court will recess until 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Colonel Shafter, I'd like a word with you, if I may. Get out of here. You're not supposed to talk to me. The reporters are over there listening, aren't they? I want to talk with you in private, Colonel. Scared? Flipper? Afraid of going back to the guardhouse for 20 more years, maybe? I'll bet those nigger senators are jumping around like apes trying to get you out of this mess, aren't they? Ever since I can remember, I've always respected men of rank until I heard you on the witness stand today. I realized then some men will never be worthy of the rank they hold. 
You think I'm going to get flustered, don't you? All I have to do is lay low until this thing blows over. Colonel, I wanted to ask ah, you... Fuck. Why don't you just take what they give you and keep your mouth shut? What do you care? When you get out, you can make a fortune as an engineer. What am I supposed to do? Let them push me aside now that I'm getting older and my leg is worse than ever? You know what I did before I joined up in 61? No, sir. I was a woodcutter. Can you see me going back to that now? And you tell your people to go easy on me, you understand? Colonel, I want you to return the personal items that were taken from my room. I never touched a thing of yours. It was Will help me. He was in charge of it. Unless I get them back today, I'm going to make my request to the full court. Then you'll have to answer to the judge. Is that what you want? Are you threatening me? I intend to fight for as long as it takes to prove my innocence and to keep my rightful place in the army. You're going to lose, and you know it. All the more reason to make a stand. Because I believe for every white colonel who should be cutting wood, there's a black private who should one day be made colonel. That is why we have to go through the bitterness of this trial, to help bring that about. I think it's worth it, don't you? Do I get my things or do I go to the court? I'll open the safe for you. That's all I'll do. Miss Smith, do you recognize these envelopes as the ones that you had on your person on 13 April? I don't know whether those are the ones or not. When you gave these to Colonel Shafter, did you not tell him that Lieutenant Flipper had given them to you? If I said it, I'm not responsible because I was so scared. Did you never have any conversation with Lieutenant Flipper about these envelopes? No, sir. I was his servant. He had no business to discuss his business with me. You say you roomed at Mrs. Olsop's? Yes, sir. But did you not make up your toilet in Flipper's bedroom? They found your combs and toothbrush on the washstand. Oh, no, sir. I dressed at Mrs. Olsop's. Well, could you? When your clothes were in Flipper's trunk and wardrobe. Didn't I have to have something to wear down to Mrs. Olsop's? I had to wear clothes for going back and forth from work. Do you still work for Lieutenant Flipper? I do his washing, cooking, and ironing. He messes with you on the slide. I object. He does not mess with me. I'm his servant. So it seems. No further questions. I have some further questions for this witness. Did you ever spend the night at Lieutenant Flipper's quarters? No, sir. I went to a dance once. And after I got back late, I went by Lieutenant Flipper's to change my dress. But I never stayed the whole night. Could you have ever spent the night at Lieutenant Flipper's without others knowing it? No, sir. Because Lieutenant Nordstrom lives next door. Thank you, Lucy. You're excused. The next defense witness is Mr. Joseph Sender. Will you swear in the next witness, please? Here's the Bible. Though perhaps you do not feel our oath binding upon you. You are an Israelite, I believe. Yes, sir. But we do worship the same God, I think. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Mr. Sender, you went to see Colonel Shafter on Monday, 16 April. Did you discuss Lieutenant Flipper's guilt? Yes, sir. I told him I'd be reluctant to loan money for a guilty man. And that's when Colonel Shafter told me he did not believe Lieutenant Flipper was guilty of embezzlement. He said he hoped we could raise the money to get Lieutenant Flipper released. And then he said he thought someone else was at the bottom of it. Did he say who he thought this someone was? He felt Lieutenant Flipper kept bad company. And this made the Colonel extremely angry. He said Flipper deserved all he was getting because he trusted too many of his uh, nigger friends. Thank you, Mr. Sender. That is all. No question. Has the defense any further witnesses to call? No, sir. 
And is the accused prepared to present his statement to the court? I am, sir. And if there are no more witnesses to be called, the court will hear the statement of the accused. Once, there was a monkey who fell in love with a beautiful young girl. He dressed as a man, went to call on her. He was so well received that one day he invited his friendly boss to come along with him. The father of the young girl asked the friendly boss some questions about Mr. Monkey. The boss said Mr. Monkey was a hard worker, an honest, but there was a secret about him. The father was anxious to know that secret, but the friendly boss said he'd tell him another day. Finally, Mr. Monkey was engaged to the young lady. On the night of the wedding, he invited his friendly boss to the supper. At the end of the supper, the friendly boss grew jealous of Mr. Monkey. He began to sing. It was a song that made all monkeys dance, whether they wanted to or not. So Mr. Monkey turned to his boss, and with his eyes, he pleaded with him, stop, stop singing. He continued, however, to sing. And all of a sudden, Mr. Monkey got up. He began to dance. He jumped about so wildly that his tail fell out of his clothes, and everyone saw that he was a monkey. The father understood the secret and beat him Dreadfully, the friendly boss, however, ran off laughing and singing. What's the matter with you, boy? Have you gone crazy? You're telling darky tales. At a time like this. Where be your brain? In your feet? Can't you see, boy? This is a courtroom. So why don't you act like it? Show some respect for Mr. Captain Colonel. Lieutenant General. What, what man? If defense counsel is ready, we will now hear his summation argument. The issue finally comes down to this one fundamental question. Is it possible for a colored man to secure and hold a position as an officer in the United States Army. During the course of this trial... A very clever lawyer, Henry. But he's beside the point. You can't fool them judges. They keen as a fox. It's you they've been watching, and they want to see Mr. Monkey dance. Can you make your knees shake? Can you? Punch your shoulders and then bob up and down like a cork on a muddy stream. If you can, now's the time to do it. He had to ask three times before he received any. Take it, Henry. Better late than never. Take it, Henry. You can't live a life forever. Physically abused, Mr. Chamberlain. Born a slave and raised in the cabin of a slave, he stepped upon our platform and asked for the privilege of competing with us for the prizes of success. All the while he distinguished himself, he had no one to turn to for counsel or sympathy. Is it any wonder then that when he found himself confronted with a financial problem he could not solve, he should hide it? and endeavor to work it out alone as he had been compelled to work out all the problems of his life. Is it fair that in his day of prosperity he is to be measured by our standards for the colored man? But in his day of adversity, by our standards for the white man? Justice and humanity demand that we pronounce him innocent of every charge. 
brought before this court. having been cleared and closed for deliberation and having maturely considered all the evidence deduced, finds the accused 2nd Lieutenant Henry O. Flipper, 10th Regiment, United States Cavalry, as follows. Of the first charge, embezzlement, not guilty. Right. When Mr. Flipper, the colored cadet, stepped forward to receive his reward for four years of hard work, the cadets gave him a rousing cheer. He deserves it. Of the second charge, conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman, specification one, lying to his commanding officer in falsely reporting transmittal of funds, guilty. Anyone who knows how quietly and bravely this young man has borne the difficulties of his position. Specification two, presenting a fraudulent check to his commanding officer, guilty. And done so without getting soured or losing courage for even a day. Specification three, making additional false statements to his commanding officer concerning the whereabouts of said funds, guilty. Anyone who knows all this would be inclined to say, Therefore, of the second charge, conduct on becoming an officer and a gentleman, guilty. That the young man deserved to be well taken care of by the government he is bound to serve. Having been found guilty of conduct on becoming an officer and a gentleman, the court does therefore sentence you, 2nd Lieutenant Henry O. Flipper, 10th Regiment, United States Cavalry, to be dismissed from the service of the United States Army. Subject to appeal and review. So terminates this court. What do we do now? We can start the appeal procedure. There isn't much hope. Well, then we better get started. Flipper took his case all the way to the President of the United States. President McKinley gave him a handshake and a smile. A few weeks after the court-martial, Lucy Smith was brought before a civil court, but the charge against her was dropped due to lack of evidence. Captain Barber continued his career as an army lawyer and distinguished himself in numerous military trials. Lieutenant Nordstrom married Molly Riley. But shortly thereafter, he came in from duty one night and caught her sitting naked on another man's lap. Colonel Shafter played a major role in the Spanish-American War. Gout-ridden, fat, he helped win the war, but completely destroyed his own reputation. Henry Flipper became a highly respected civilian mining engineer. And before he died, he was appointed assistant to the Secretary of the Interior. His rank was finally restored, and he was given an honorable discharge, posthumously, in December of 1976.